Hope City Church, welcome back. Part two of temples, what it looks like to be the modern day temple and to be the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Last week when we were together, we were looking at this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, where the Apostle Paul, chart, talking to the church of Corinth, he says, hey, remember, you are the temple of God. And then later in chapter 7, he says, do you not know that you're the temple of God? That your body is the temple, that the fullness of God dwells in you. Now, of course, in Corinth, he's talking to a group of people who are being inundated by polytheism. There's definitely temples to unknown, false, and fake gods, idols, idols everywhere. And so what he's trying to get through to them is it's really less about the temple and more, the brick and mortar, and more about the presence of God dwelling in you and flowing through you. Now, just to catch you up in case you weren't here last week or you haven't had a chance to watch last week's message, I challenge you go back and catch it. But let me catch you up really quick because this was a unique week. We did a two-part sermon series. And in this two-part sermon series, we're talking about the four things that the old Testament temple was known for and how you as the modern day temple of God, the placeholder, the keeper, the container for the Holy Spirit, the temple of God where he dwells in 2021, right? The place where God dwells, the connectivity for humanity. There were four things that the temple was known for. Now, the first one was the temple was visible. And we were talking about Matthew chapter five, when Jesus talks about, you know, if you were to light a candle, you wouldn't hide it. And like a city on a hill, that that light is supposed to shine from far away so people can see it because the temple was visible. It was something you could see as you came into Jerusalem, you could have seen the temple from far, far away. The temple was not only visible, but the temple was was precious and beautiful and the stuff that the temple was made out of was quality right so the characteristics that translates to us is are you living your life where the characteristics what you're made of the characteristics of Christ in you are visible for humanity are you healthy are you godly are you living a life in such a way where people can see that the Holy Spirit is at work in you I'm talking about kindness compassion I'm talking about love and understanding I'm talking about the fruits of the Spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness self-control right these are the things that let people see that the Holy Spirit is at work in you and through you. So that level of lifestyle that you're allowing God to shift you from who you're becoming, it's less about who you're trying to be and who you're actually becoming, right? It's not what you believe should change who you become and who you become shifts how you behave. It goes from your head to your hearts, to your hands, to your habits. This is the idea. Number two from last week, the temple was meant to be a house of prayer. From the New King James in Luke chapter 19, Jesus says, my house is a house of prayer. And at the moment, he's a little frustrated that people are abusing the temple. He says, no, no, this is supposed to be a holy space, a holy place where we communicate with God. Well, you no longer have to go to a fixed facility that only certain people are allowed into uh, in only part, certain times a day where you'd book an appointment, travel a far distance, and hope that you, after waiting in line, get to see a priest who relates to the high priest and takes your sacrifice and offers it to God on your behalf. That you actually have access to the fullness of God in your everyday walking around, boring, eating, sleeping life. And temple... The building, although the, the concrete brick and mortar of the temple itself, that concept may be gone. The principle of the temple still stands. You're supposed to be visible as the temple of God. People should be able to see you living your life out loud and the presence of God active in your life. Number one. Number two, the temple was supposed to be a place of prayer. That Your life should be a place where prayer is normalized. Let your kids see you pray. Let your friends see you pray. Be willing to pray on a regular basis. Don't shy away from prayer. Begin practicing praying in public. Begin practicing praying. Not so that you could be like at a restaurant and make a big deal out of your prayer and be some sort of weirdo, awkward, super saved Christian, but that you would be the kind of Christian that prays authentically and that your prayers would be less about asking the cosmic vending machine to give you the soda of your choice and more about you communicating with the creator of heaven and earth. Now, this week, I want to continue our conversation. The temple, number three, was supposed to be a place that was holy. Now, there were many times that the ancient Israelites would abuse the temple spaces, especially the places outside of the temple, and turn them into far other things. But, you know, the temple was supposed to be holy. Psalm 11, 
verse 4 says the Lord is in his holy temple. And so holiness, this Christ-centered concept of holiness, is completely different than any other religion's version of holiness. Now let me just take a moment and unpack this for you, if you will, for just a second. What do I mean by this? Holiness is not supposed to be your final destination. It's actually your point of origin. Your origin story starts from a place of holiness. Now, I know you've heard me say, and I know you've heard other pastors preach before, that we're all born into sin. This is true, that sin has entered humanity and we're all born into sin. But as a Christ follower, you are made new. So as a Christ follower, your origin story, your beginning begins with holiness. Jesus says to his disciples, therefore be holy for I am holy holy. He's not telling them how to behave. He's talking about positionally. Because you're part of my family, you are. Relationally, you are. Now, the reason that this is so different than any other faith, any other world religion, is that in any other faith, any other world religion, you start off as a place of evil, and then you have to do things to become holy. The beautiful thing about being a Christ follower is all you have to do is receive the gift of Jesus' love, his compassion, his kindness, his understanding, his forgiveness, and you are positionally made holy, sanctified, set apart for a purpose, justified, just as if it never happened, and, right, regenerated, like made new, brand new. So sanctification, justification, regeneration, made new. And so your new origin story like the superhero that you are, the dweller of the Holy Spirit. Your origin story is from a place of holiness. There's nothing you could ever do to make God love you any more or any less than he already does. There's nothing that you need to do or try to accomplish to get God to be on your side. You already, he already is. He is for you. He has plans and purposes for you. And so because of that, the deal is, is for you to keep your temple a holy space, a holy place. Now, this is less about actions and behavior and more about positioning yourself. Now, I'm going to give you an example of this. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, we find Jesus at his baptism. Jesus is in the wilderness. He comes up to his cousin, John. He walks up to John. He says, baptize me. Um, John had been baptizing people um, in the baptism of repentance. And so he was telling everybody, get ready. The Messiah is coming. You need to repent and so cleanse yourself. And so he was doing these ceremonial baptisms in the wilderness. Jesus rolls up. John's baptizing some people. He walks up. John has a realization that his cousin Jesus is actually the Messiah. He's known this since before he was born, actually. Look it up. It's a cool story. Um, And he says, oh, I can't baptize you. I'm not worthy to even tie your sandals. And Jesus says, you will baptize me. And so then John's like, oh, okay. I mean, you're the Messiah. I'll do what you say. So then John baptizes him. And in that moment, it says that the Holy Spirit ascended from heaven, (coughs) descended from heaven as like a dove. And so the presence of God, so Jesus is there, the Holy Spirit's there, and the Father speaks. And this is what the Father says, right? He says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, the reason that this is so important, the reason I want you to grasp this for a second, right? Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, he is the co-creator. He is the, the maker of heaven and earth, the forgiver of sins, ah, ah, savior of the universe. Yes. But in this moment, Jesus is fully human and fully God. And in this moment, he's being baptized. So he's embracing his humanity. He's setting an example. And notice what God says about him when he's being baptized. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus had not begun his public ministry yet. Jesus hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't preached any sermons. He hasn't done any miraculous works. He hasn't done anything that would make God pleased with him. Because it's not performance-based. It's positional. As As part of the family of God... You, the temple of God, the fullness, the connection point between heaven and earth for all of humanity now. Like it's positional. You have the blessings of God. It's a familial blessing. It's a family thing. And so it's not the what that God says, but it's the when he said it. Of course, God, lo- G- the father loves his son, but he says it before he's done anything to be pleased about. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Well pleased with what? You haven't done anything. 
I'm well pleased because he's willing to do it. I'm well pleased because he's willing to be the high priest that would take the sins of humanity. I'm well pleased that he's stepping out in faith and taking steps towards this moment in time. Now, before you sort of get off the rails with regards to holiness, because if you've been in church for any length of time, if you're old like me, there was a time where certain churches were all about holiness. And I, I use finger quotes when I say holiness, because what I mean by that is they were all about legalism. They were all about making extra biblical rules that made it really hard to be a Christ follower that really had nothing to do with honoring God with your life, but everything to do with making you sort of be different or set apart. And the, the good intentions, poor execution. So here, and the reason it was like, well, we need to separate ourselves. We need to isolate ourselves. We need to look different. And so they would say things like, well, I know you're in the world, but don't be of the world. And so we can't listen to music that isn't Christian music. We have to dress different, talk different. Women shouldn't wear makeup and men should be, you know, modest and blah, 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 blah. And all these things that they would do. And they were missing the point because they were focused on the outward and when your origin story is from a place of holiness, the inward is what really matters. And so let me say it to you like this. Your holiness can't be perfected because it already is perfect. Did you hear me now? Because your holiness is connected to the holiness of God that dwells in you. It's already perfected by the work of the cross. So instead of trying to perfect your holiness with your behavior, what if you decided to spend more energy reflecting your holiness? Do you hear me now? You don't have to earn your salvation. You need to share salvation with the world around you. You come from an origin story of holiness. Therefore, use that strength, that power, that intensity to share with others what holiness looks like. Holiness is not a series of rules that you must follow. Holiness is not a way that you cut your hair or that you live your life or shows that you watch. While holiness might guard, you might guard your heart from some of those things, holiness is different. In other words, your circumstances aren't going to ever be able to pollute your holiness unless you give them permission to. Did you hear me? Tough times, hard things, brokenness, disease, failures, suffering, addiction. It can't ruin your holiness because you're positionally holy because of your relationship with Jesus and because you are the dwelling for the Holy Spirit. But if you allow yourself to be polluted, so you have to give permission for negative circumstances to pollute your life. You can't accidentally backslide. It's a choice that you make. It's a choice to get lazy in your faith, to not be a person of prayer, to not have a person whose life is visible, to not be a person who believes that the holy place should remain a holy place. Paul says it like this in Romans 8, chapter 38 and 39. He says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers nor height nor depth or anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As I hear Paul's words, I think about there is no brokenness in our relationships. There is no virus in this culture, in this world. There is no political party. There is no financial situation. There is no sin that I've committed or issue that I've been a part of or brokenness or, or fumble or misstep or mistake that can separate me from God's love. God's love is God's love. And the only thing that can separate me from God's love is me letting go. I think of it like a child holding on. Whenever I have my grandson Abraham with me and we get out of the car or we walk outside of a store, I always tell him that it's a parking lot. Even if it's not really a parking lot, I tell him, be careful, it's a parking lot. There's cars, there's cars. I don't want him to dart out of the target. And even though we're on the concrete, even though we're in that courtyard area before it gets to the parking lot, I want him to hold my hand. Even when we're in a parking lot, I call it the street. Hey, we're in the street, hold my hand, we're in the street because I don't want him to get ran over. There's a lot of times that he doesn't want to hold my hand because he doesn't want to be safe, but I'm not going to let go of his hand because I love him, because I want to protect him, because I want what's best for him. 
And so I'm going to keep him on the path. And by, by virtue of him being my grandson, I got a hold of his hand and I'm going to keep him safe. I'm going to keep him walking in a safe distance, safe perspective, safe direction. But if he wants to, he can pull hard enough that he can get free from my hand. I'm never going to let go of him, but he can let go of me. The reason that this is so important is that holiness is that pos- is positional, but you can decide to not position yourself in the place of God's blessing. You can decide to walk away from that place, that space of holiness. So I don't want you to worry about, well, I watch this movie or I listen to this music or I, I, I have a relationship that's broken or, or I drank too much this weekend or I did this too much that weekend or whatever and go, oh, great, now I'm, now I'm ruined I'm no longer holy. God doesn't want me. No, these aren't excuses to do those things, but you don't have to perfect your holiness. You have to reflect your holiness. Show people what it looks like with your testimony, the way you live your life every day, even in the midst of your broken seasons, even in the midst of your pain, your suffering, your depression, your anxiety, even in the midst of the darkest seasons that you've ever been through, that you still see yourself as God's dearly loved holy space, the holy of holies, where God dwells in you, flows through you. The fourth and final thing that the Old Testament temple was known for, the Old Testament temple was known for a place of miracles. When Solomon had finished praying as a blessing over the temple in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, he had finished praying. God had just got done saying, this is the place where I will dwell. This is the place where people can come and meet me face to face. This is the place where I will forgive sins. And then Solomon, this is what he says. Listen, Solomon finished praying. He prayed a blessing, consecration of the temple, and fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not even enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled it. It was so overwhelming to have the presence of God that the priests couldn't even go inside. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord around the temple, They knelt down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. The temple was supposed to be a place where miracles happen. You have the ability to be a modern day miracle for the people that God's entrusted to you. As you journey through life, please, please, please keep believing in miracles as a holder of the presence of God, as the connection point for the humanity, the connection point that heaven comes to earth in and through you, instead of spending time trying to perfect what is already perfect, the holiness of God that dwells in you, reflect that holiness to the world around you. Stop making it an inward, navel-gazing, narcissistic exercise and start making it a opportunity for people to see that if you can do it, listen now, I'm going to tell you something right now. If your pastor can do it, you can do it. I am not a special person. I am just a regular man, just like everybody else. It's my understanding that my place of origin is holy. It's my understanding that it's important for me to walk in that holiness. It's my understanding that I need to make the temple visible. I need to make my temple a house of prayer, that I need to make my temple a place where miracles still happen. And sometimes that miracle is something simple, like you being a listener when no one else is listening, you being a leader when no one else is leading, you loving and being kind, you being generous to your neighbors, you going out of your way to care for the people that God's entrusted right next to you when no one else is doing it. Sometimes the miraculous is as simple as you buying the grocery store for the little old lady behind you, you see fumbling for change. Sometimes the miraculous is something as simple as when you feel God saying you should call somebody, you actually picking up the phone and calling them. Sometimes the miraculous happens is when you see somebody standing on the corner with a cardboard sign, instead of you just looking straight ahead, you say hi to them. I don't care if you give them a dollar or a bottle of water. I don't care if you buy them a sandwich or not. You looking them in the face and the miraculous thing in their life that might happen was that you, they weren't invisible to you anymore. 
you'd be surprised the miracles that you could perform every day in Jesus name. Sure. We could perform big miracles in Jesus name, but why don't we start practicing the small ones first? As you journey through this life, keep believing in miracles. God's miracle power in you is not just for you and your needs alone, but it's you reflecting the holiness of God, reflecting the miraculous of God so that you can meet the needs of others, those he's entrusted to you. Okay, I wanna leave you guys with a couple of thoughts to think about this week. A couple of things, if you got your notebooks, I want you to write these down. Listen, as you were thinking today during the message, I want you to journal about this, you ready? Did your understanding of holiness change? And does it need to continue to change? Does it need to evolve? Does it need to grow? Is it less about earning holiness? That sort of latter perspective, each year I just wanna be a little bit better person so God will love me a little bit more? No, that's not how it works. You, as a Christ follower, when you became born again, your origin story is you are positionally made holy because you are part of the family of God. So stop trying to perfect your holiness and start trying to reflect your holiness. And then lastly, how is God calling you to reflect that holiness this week? What are some practical ways? And I want you to write these down on a piece of paper somewhere. I want you to type these down on your laptop somewhere. What are some practical ways that you can live out and reflect holiness? What does it look like for you to do it at work? What does it look like for you to reflect holiness at home? What does it look like for you to reflect holiness on the freeway, at the grocery store, at the coffee shop? What does it look like for you to reflect the holiness of God that already dwells in you? Because you, my friends, are the temple of the Holy Spirit.